So welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Cleveland. I recently departed from the UN Human Rights Committee, one of those treaty bodies that's been uh, floating out there in the conversations uh, to date. Um, and I've been very gratified by the insights both into implementation in general and also in the interaction between human rights courts and uh, national institutions uh, thus far today. Uh, today, this afternoon, we're turning to um, institutional challenges within the three regional human rights systems. Uh, but before we turn to our panelists, I wanted to congratulate Murray Hunt. Is he in the room? Yeah, Murray, you're hiding back there. I want to congratulate Murray Hunt not only for his um, tremendous leadership of the Bingham Center, but he was uh, recently appointed by the United Kingdom as one of the UK's two independent experts on the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe. And I think it's a, it's a tremendously wise appointment by the UK, and I want to congratulate him and wish him luck for that. Um, so turning to the panel, uh, we have people to speak about all three of the regional human rights systems, um, and we will do it in the following order. I thought we would start uh, with Joseph Wittall, uh, Commissioner of Ghana's Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, uh, then turn to Clara Sandoval Villalba uh, to discuss the Inter-American Human Rights System. She's also with the Human Rights Law Implementation <coughs> Project um, and at the University of Essex. Uh, then we'll turn to the European uh, Regional Human Rights System um, with Judge Roger <coughs> Spano, Vice President of the European Court of Human Rights, um, and Professor Philip Leach of Middlesex University. Um, so with that, uh, let's turn it over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know that you are all from lunch and uh, apparently I need to do more than uh, keep up to be able to keep you alert. <laughs> and so um, let me first thank the organizers for the opportunity of coming to share some views with you. And uh, in particular, I'm grateful to the Bingham Center, the uh, Human Rights Centers of Essex and Bristol, and the, the third party? Oxford. The Oxford. Oxford. <laughs> Oxford. <laughs> for the opportunity. Uh, in this regard, I'll be speaking on challenges, especially the prospects, not the challenges alone, of the African uh, human rights protection system. I would do, deal more on the prospects, but of course, to give the, the, the context, since the whole morning has been about, uh, uh, I wouldn't say resilience or positivism, I would go positive when it comes to how the system operates in terms of the prospects and opportunities going into the future. And so what are the challenges? Um, first of all, what, what, what is the African uh, Human Rights Protection System? For those of us who may not appreciate what it is, it comprises the Africa Commission on Human and People's Rights, the African Court on Human and People's Rights, and the African Committee of Experts on the rights and welfare of the child. Three from regional system. And listening to some of you today, it's clear that the system 
then in the Americas and the European systems are together with quite a number of challenges which are not different from what uh, we have, but of course the context will differ. In this case, we're dealing with non-implementation of decisions and recommendations of the Commission and the Court. Uh, the committee doesn't, hasn't done so much, even though the few things that it has come up with are very uh, phenomenal. But my concentration will be on the Commission and the Court. It is, in, in the case of the Africa Court and Africa Commission, it is not so much about non-implementation as a situation of states refusing to comply with or implement the decisions and recommendations and judgments of the court or the, the, the commission. But for me, it's more about, if you look at the context, and I'll, I'll give the context from my Ghanaian experience, it's more about the inability in country of government focal institutions, in this case mostly it's the Attorney General's Department or the Ministry of Justice, not having the institutional capacity and I would say the coordinating function to be able to perform, to galvanize everybody together to implement the decision. And sometimes some are completely <coughs> even ignorant of decisions that of the, co the commission we call that affect them. It would be strange for a government not to know a decision that has gone against it. But it is also not surprising because previous decisions, governments are continue, previous decisions that have been handed down during previous governments and they fail to implement. New governments have come and they are not aware of those decisions and judgments. And so, if that is all brought to their attention, they just go on. And everything looks as if it is about non-implementation. But I would say, in the context that I knew, it is not. And I'll give you an example of two from within Ghana. Ghana doesn't have many cases that have decisions that have come from the Africa Commission Court. But of course, we're talking about regional and other international obligations that Ghana has to meet. The Universal Periodic Review comes out with recommendations from time to time. In fact, for the first time, it was through the prompting of my commission as a national human rights institution that got the, the initial report on the Human Rights Committee prodding government and bringing all actors together for us to put that report before the committee for the first time. How did that happen? It simply isn't because the state refused to carry out the recommendations or do its reporting as in the case of the Human Rights Committee, but simply they didn't see the need. And it would be surprising for you to, 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 to wonder how a state will not see the need. If you, you don't have the capacity at the level of the Attorney General, the Minister of Justice, and to appreciate the importance of meeting state obligations, what happens? I don't want to be seen to be running down my country, but that's a fact. So we had to intervene. The report has been submitted to the Human Rights Committee and we are all happy about it. With regard to the Universal Periodic Review, we, the National Human Rights Commission has had to bring together quite a number of actors. We are not supposed to do that. But we are supposed to assist the state to ensure that the report or the recommendations that it accepted are implemented. But when you stay in a country where Attorney General staff are more interested in local litigation, in fact they are inundated with 
criminal and other issues than civil litigation in the domestic <coughs> arena to the extent that they don't have the resources to handle international obligations, then we need to bring other actors on board. So the point I'm making is that when you look across Africa, and I'm sure my colleague uh, Gay So is here, quite is only few countries, quite about one or two, talk about UK, talk about one and other uh, countries that would, for their own reasons, not go along with implementation of certain decisions. But the wide swath of countries in Africa would be ready if they we are able to galvanize a good mass of domestic actors for them to, to, to work on. And that is something that I think we should do more. But the good part of it is that it is not it's not negative. It is simply that we need to get critical mass of actors within the domestic sphere coming together to work at, at these things. The second issue that I would want to quickly mention is that I think the Africa Commission, I wouldn't blame the court much, but the Africa Commission could do more. Because if you have the right to promote human rights, your promotional activities throughout the countries, there should be visibility <coughs> in the Commission. But it is of recent times that we see visibility from the Human Rights Commission actually coming to a domestic level to engage actors, letting them know the, 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 the need to either do their state reporting or decisions that have to be followed up to be followed up. What happens then? So it, it will mean that in the past, if people were not following or people were not carrying out in the decisions and the judgments of the court and the commission, it's more because the commission in particular has remained invisible at the domestic arena. And it is something that we need to look at. The good news is that we have seen that through the activism of some NGOs and now uh, the National Human Rights Institutions Network for Africa, we are seeing some new synergy in the visibility of the, the Human Rights Commission and the court in the, the domestic sphere. That is something which I think is, is positive. The prospects and the opportunities that I think, given my time, that I need to spend quickly a, a time on is one, to indicate that the Africa Agenda 2063, the starting point of the optim optimism that I have and that Africa has, because the agenda has galvanized a lot of, a groundswell of positive attitude towards the protection and promotion of human rights from the African continent. The 10 year action plan and the human rights strategy of the Africa Commission indicates to what extent, at the continental level, human rights are beginning to take center stage. Of course, they have been because of the institutional framework, the charter, and all that. But to begin to <coughs> crystallize and see the need to have a human rights strategy, that is something positive that we can be looking at. The other one is that the African Union Commission, which actually takes care of the, the, the EU organs such as the African Commission and the African Union, eh, the Africa Court, has entered into some MOU with the network of national human rights institutions, which is very positive. And we have about 44 national human rights institutions in, in Africa. And there's a need to see how we can get the support of the, or get the, 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 the buy-in of the, these 44 working closely at the national level when it comes to the implementation of decisions and judgments of the court and commission. This MOU has led to a number of activities and 
some of them, one is the development of, of some guidelines for the, the, in terms of the role that the national human rights institutions can play in the implementation of the, of the decisions and judgments of the Commission and Court, which is very good and uh, let me take the opportunity to uh, recognize and acknowledge the efforts of Professor Murray, uh, Rachel, I know there are many Murrays here who are also professors, but I mean Rachel Murray, for what she's done uh, for the network of African Human Rights Commissions. The guidelines have proved very useful because as a result of those guidelines, workshops have been held, bringing the African Union, in fact, the Political Affairs Department of the Af African Union Commission, the Africa Commission, in terms of the commissioners, and the Africa Court, in terms of the judges, together in a workshop to brainstorm <coughs> how national human rights institutions can take the, the space at the domestic level, added to other actors in the implementation of uh, decisions and judgments of the regional system, which I think is good. The outcome was that the judges all agreed, the commissioners all agreed that they need the national human rights institutions, working collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with civil society at the domestic level and in the parliaments, the critical mass of local actors that uh, was alluded to this morning for action to be seen to operate. Let's not look at challenges on the basis of somebody says zero sum game. The court has ruled or the commission has given a decision, the state has to comply, the state has not complied, and so there's a problem. In between, a number of things can happen. <clears throat> have we brought national human rights institutions who have, under the Paris principle, the bridging role to link <coughs> up to government and the international system and civil society? to bring people together, to see the need to implement decisions. That is what is taking place now. And I think it's a positive response. And since my time is not there, I conclude with this uh, activity that as a result of the guidelines, the network of African National Human Rights Institutions has gone, has looked at certain judgments and decisions the Enderice case in Kenya and the Ojik, uh, these are matters in Kenya, mm -hmm. that uh, the governments of Kenya, the state of Kenya, had not been complying with. As a result of the guidelines, the network has been able to bring all the actors together under the, 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 the ages of the Kenya National Human Rights Commission. And <coughs> A task force has been formed, action plans have been taken as to how specifically the state can comply or implement the Endorise case and the case. And these are very huge cases that involve 700,000 people who have been uh, <coughs> rendered, uh, whose nationality have been taken away as a result of. Kenya's decision not to recognize them as nationals, but whose nationality has been brought back as a result of the, the court's decision and the commission's the, 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 the commission's decision and the court's judgment in both the Endora and OG. This matter is playing out very smoothly and I think it may be too too early days yet, but the good part is that state is ready to implement the decision <clears throat> given an understanding that if you you bring the state with other actors together and you understand what the judgment actually means to the people they will do so Cote d'Ivoire you are aware of the nationality situation there even involving the, uh, the current uh, prime minister president yeah. again the network of African Human Rights Commissions under the aegis of the Code of National Human Rights Institution. And using the guidelines that have been uh, you know, set out for the implementation 
to guide the implementation of the, the decisions and judgments of the court. That country is also ready and going through the process of how specifically to implement the decisions. And these are good signs and I think the story may not be so negative after all. Um, Africa may not be, uh, may have issues with other things but not uh, uh, ultra-nationalism. It's about poverty, it's about lack of understanding of what actually has gone against the state or what the state has to comply with. And so once you remove that block, the opportunity to respect and implement the decisions and the judgments of the court and the commission uh, is certainly an issue that we should be happy with. And that will, let me thank you so much for the opportunity. I'll take the opportunity. This morning we heard um, from several speakers that we need to broaden our understanding and the way we think about the concept of implementation, um, as well as uh, disaggregate the way we think about states and their role in implementation. I think the po one of the positive messages here is that uh, when states don't implement it, isn't always because they're hostile or because they've made a, a decision not to implement it. It may simply be a lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, lack of technical expertise, um, and that national human rights institutions as well as civil society can play an important role in building that bridge and road. Okay, so let's go to Clara and the Inter-American System. system of human rights. Uh, there are many challenges that the system is currently facing. I'm just mentioning here some, and I will dedicate particular attention to some of them. Uh, there is a huge political backlash in the region, as was explained this morning. And just to make it a bit more palpable to you, I just want to refer to what is currently happening there. Just to give you an example, earlier uh, in May, uh, we had the government of Chile, Colombia, Paraguay, Argentina and Brazil uh, writing a letter to the Inter-American Commission complaining in a way to the Commission saying we want more subsidiarity, we want it to be more legalistic, not only you but also the Inter-American uh, Court, and, and we want things in a way to be done differently. Yeah? We are not happy with the current state of affairs. This is of course not new, this has been happening for quite some time, as Jimena Phil explained, we are accustomed somehow to crisis. Our normalcy is crisis, yes? Uh, but this also happens in a period where we have various countries in the region trying to enact various amnesty laws. We thought that that period was over. Well, no. El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, there is like a spillover again of that that we thought we had been able to impact, we had been able to manage somehow. So all of that is back in a context where we have Venezuela, where we have Trump, where we have Bolsonaro. 
So the, the, the current political space in the Americas region is one for concern, I have to say. And that is the context we have to acknowledge. And that's the context where the inter-American system is having to work. So I think we really need to have this backlash in mind, despite the resilience of the system, because it certainly impacts the way the system works and the potential for effective social change the system can engage with and can actually promote. I want to talk about other of the challenges that we face. We cannot forget that we are not yet the European system. We don't have permanent judges. We don't have permanent commissioners. So it is not only an issue about not having economic resources. We don't have permanent judges. We don't have permanent commissioners. We need that. We need that, and I think that's one of the areas where we need urgent change. If we really want to be able to deal with the challenges that human rights are putting on our table, we have to have the, the human capacity to deal with that, which are not only the members of the secretariats of these bodies, which are there on a permanent basis. But we need these judges to, to further understand, and these commissioners to further understand, and to further engage and own what they are working on. I think we have a massive issue there that we need to deal with. Lack of financial resources, you've been referring to it, but it definitely hampers the way we do the work. And I will be referring to this issue as I talk about uh, problems of implementation. Lack of ratification by all the OAS member states of the American Convention. It's not like in Europe that by being part to the Council of Europe, you, are, you have to be party to the European Convention on Human Rights. No, in America, states can actually choose. And I think that is deeply problematic that the inter-American system continues to be the Latin American system, although few Caribbean countries are part of it. We need to create mechanisms <coughs> to engage these other countries. In our project, for example, we also included Canada. And we included Canada very intentionally. Many people questioned that decision. <coughs> many people were saying to us, oh, why Canada? There are so many countries with so many problems in the Americas. Why Canada? And well, there is a very good reason. Canada is part of the organization of American states. It's a very powerful country. It definitely influences international relations. And we wanted to see how well it was doing in terms of human rights implementation. And we wanted to understand why does it relate much better to the treaty monitoring bodies, UN, than to the inter-American system. And it was fascinating what we found. But there were only two cases decided by the Inter-American Commission against Canada. Why are we failing to engage with those other states? What can we do to change that? Uh, issues related also uh, to technical tools to process big data. And here I just anticipate an issue that I'm going to mention later on implementation. Uh, these systems cannot even manage, we were talking this morning with Jimena, their historical memory because there is no a good system to make sense of that memory. Neither at the Inter-American Commission, not at the Inter-American Court. We held an event in December at the Inter-American Commission when we showed the, the Hoodock system. They were saying, well, you know, you're dreaming. Of course, you will never have this. I, well, I want to dream that it's possible to have a system that, that allows transparency, accessibility, that empowers that ecosystem, etc. That system is absolutely crucial, and not many are thinking about it. And there is a further system as a further problem, and it's the problem of implementation, but I'm going to focus here particularly to the problems of implementation of judgments and of recommendations, be them from the Inter-American Court, the orders, or be them from the Inter-American Commission, their recommendations. And here, the first thing I would like to say is this. Implementation, this morning, uh, we were talking about whether it is relevant still today to talk about implementation or not. I want to make a plea for implementation. And my plea is the following. If the whole idea is subsidiarity, if the whole idea is that the supranational system is a system that should complement when the system at the domestic level is unable to do its job, then we need implementation. Implementation not only of individual measures, but particularly and strongly of guarantees of non-repetition that are capable to address the structural issues that have caused the violations. Yes, that's why implementation is so, so relevant. And that's the contribution that cases can make to changing how domestic things happen. 
So it's not just because of the victim. It's because there are underlying issues that we need to address, and we cannot miss that opportunity. Also because we need to understand that relationship between implementation and impact. Impact, in my view, is highly contained if implementation doesn't happen. Impact, as I was saying before when I was talking about amnesty laws, is highly contained. We see an amazing Inter-American Court and an Inter-American Commission coming up with very clear, uh, a very clear stand on, on amnesties, on statutes of limitation, etc. But we get the backlash. This year, when we thought that that had already gone, yes? And the system has to immediately reaccommodate, and I'm going to explain how it is doing that now. But I definitely think that if there was implementation, it would be much harder for the states to try to change the rules of the game. The impact will definitely last longer. So I think that we need to think very carefully about this relationship between impact and uh, implementation. Uh, the other point I want to make is we have been referring particularly to the courts, but I want to remind you that the inter in the inter-American system, we also have the inter-American commission. This is a two-tier system as in Africa. And I think this changes a bit the logic of the system. In the system, in the inter-American system, we not only have 200 cases. We have to remember that in the inter-American commission, the cases go first. There are more than 20,000 cases that have been brought before a commission that doesn't have permanent commissions. A commission that also engages with highly complex forms of reparation. And then, only if the, the implementation doesn't happen at the, at the commission level and if all the variables are there, the case goes to the Inter-American Court. And this is just to put the commission in center stage because the role of the commission is incredibly relevant. And I want to know this, and I want to also think about how to look at the untapped potential of the Inter-American Commission when we think about uh, implementation. This leads me to the point, complex reparations. We have, as, as Jimena was saying earlier, we have a system that has crafted the most holistic jurisprudence on reparations. It engages with compensation, restitution, satisfaction, rehabilitation, and guarantees of non-repetition. If we are to think about one of the legacies of the inter-American system, certainly reparations is one of them. And it will be at the forefront in my personal view. But dealing with reparations does come at expense. It's not that easy to deal with this issue. Complex reparations put many challenges on the, ta on the table, particularly related to the issue of how to implement them. How do we measure them? How do we craft those forms of reparation? And this is something that I want to know. This is done not only by the Inter-American Court, it's also done by the Inter-American Commission more and more. If the Inter-American Commission 20 years ago, 30 years ago, was coming up with very general uh, recommendations, today they are highly more prescriptive. And, and in my personal view, I see a, a, a tendency that we need to discuss, as, as Rachel said this morning with some caution, about this tendency towards a specificity. But also, the Commission is engaging with more forms of preparation, as well as the Inter-American Court. And I just want to give you an example. Uh, for those of you who have never had the, the pleasure to read a fantastic judgment, one of my favorite ones, and this case was included in our project, and it's the case of Plan de Sanchez versus Guatemala. This is a paradigmatic case of more than 240 people who were massacred back in 1982 in Guatemala by the armed forces. Uh, very sad case where they were put all in a house, uh, women were raped, uh, they were put in fire. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an emblematic case of the conflict and of the massacres that took place in Guatemala. Indigenous peoples, of course. <coughs> one of the orders, this is one of the orders, because there were about 13 orders given by the court in that case, included issues like a study and dissemination of the Mayashi culture in the affected communities through the Guatemalan Academy of Mayan Languages or a similar organization. Maintenance and improvement of the road systems between the set communities and the municipal capital of Ravina. A sewer system and potable water supply, which by the way, this one came with a footnote to the general <coughs> covenant, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights on the subject. So, mm. economic, social and cultural rights did not begin with the Inter-American Court in the Cusco <coughs> Lagos Campos case. 
the Inter-American Court was trying hard to, to find ways to include the topic much earlier on. A supply of teaching personnel, trained in intercultural or bilingual teaching for primary, secondary, or comprehensive schooling, etc. Highly complex forms of reparation. And this is just one order. This is just one order. What happened, I, I had the opportunity to visit Plan de Sanchez, uh, and I, none of these measures has been implemented. None of these ones. I'm thinking particularly about these ones. To get to Plan de Sanchez, I thought the car I was in was going to, to be destroyed because it was the most impossible road. And I was lucky because it was not the rainy season. We were told that during the rainy season, it's basically impossible to get there. Uh, how many members of the state have arrived there? I will tell you a story about that in a minute. But this is highly complicated to implement. And now we have a new a jurisprudence in the Inter-American Court also looking at economic, social, and cultural rights and direct justiciability of these rights that brings with it, with it various questions about complex forms of reparation, guarantees of non-repetition, how we are going to measure them, how we are going to implement them, etc. And that opens, of course, challenges for practitioners as to how far can we go with that and how do we do to ensure that that actually happens uh, in reality. But let me say this, uh, the court, and here IFA, you were mentioning earlier that of course in your situation it is, it is, the, uh, it is uh, your own committee, the one that has to monitor uh, what happens uh, with the recommendations. The court, the Inter-American court, a non, with no non-permanent judges, also has to monitor its own judgments. Uh, at the moment, since 2015, there is a new unit monitoring uh, compliance with the judgments. Uh, four persons work in that unit, four. We were saying that 53 are working at the, uh, at the executive, at the Department of Execution of Judgments. 39. 39. 39. What, 39. 39. Okay. We have 208 cases according to the latest report of the Inter-American Court, but we have 1,140 orders of reparation. Most of them at least 80% of them of the complexity I showed you. So the case law might, might not be high, but the complexity of the issue demands a lot of work. And that's the point I want to put on the table when you have four persons dealing with it. We have problems of transparency, availability, and accessibility of data. Experts are not getting to the system always, in some cases they do, but not always to provide the court with the tools it needs to really be able to inform the way these reparation measures are ordered and the way they should be measured and they should be followed up. And we need also to be able to empower domestic constituencies. Uh, and there is, of course, a lack of response by political bodies in the organization to do the job they could do. I wish we had a committee of ministers. We don't. I think, yeah, I do, I do. I still believe, I, I agree with Basha when she says, you know, <coughs> the fact that you have the, the Department of, of Execution uh, of Judgments that is like a technocratic body within the committee, helping the committee, balances out this political dimension of the committee of ministers and allows the committee of ministers to engage in a different way with this. I wish the General Assembly in the Organization of American States uh, had, had something like an executive body in the Council of Europe, we don't. And the, and the General Assembly, although it's by the American Convention called their role in relation to this, has done nothing uh, in relation to that. Why? Question mark. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the cases, but through, this, through the positive prism, I want to be optimistic. I want to believe that this is a struggle and we have quite a few tools and an untapped potential really to ensure that things actually happen among other things to help impact. Resilience and creativity. There has been a lot of creative thinking in a court that, as I said, doesn't have permanent judges. Uh, and it has been able, the court, to create its own tools through experiences like experimental. No, to actually try and follow up on what is happening with the cases. I think the interest in the Americas changed in around the year 2000. I think that up until the year 2000, most of the interest in the region was about producing judgments. We needed to set the jurisprudence, the foundations. 
but because of the implementation crisis and also because the transformation of the system, you know, it was no longer a baby. It was now in its youth. Now we need to think about implementation. And this changed, changed the, the, the game. And we created, we, I said we, yeah. no, <laughs> they, they created a very interesting tools. And I'm gonna refer to some of them, there are various ones, but the most powerful ones for me are hearings, hearings, and you were, uh, Judge Spano, you were asking earlier, uh, you know, how is that engagement? So I'm gonna show you now what happens with the hearings. Uh, so this is a public hearing. Public hearings are used by the court in relation to very difficult cases. By the way, I should say, one of the problems with hearings is that we don't really have criteria established by the court as to when it will call a hearing. Neither for a private one, neither for a public one. There is no specific criteria, and during our interviews with the different stakeholders working in the system and with the system, it was consistently claimed that we need clear criteria. Because in some cases you request one, you are not giving it. In other cases you request it, yes, you get it. So no clarity, no transparency, this point needs to be changed. Public hearings happen in difficult cases. When you really need like a make a statement, impact, quick impact, I think that's the way to translate it. One example, earlier in the year, uh, February, when Guatemala decided to come up with an amnesty law to its national reconciliation law, uh, civil society, and I want to highlight here the ecosystem, because the ecosystem is key, the system hasn't done this on its own, it's the ecosystem too. The ecosystem said to the court, we need a hearing, there is an amnesty law in the process of being approved in Guatemala, we need to hamper this process because the consequence of that would be that various cases decided by the court, 14 I think, would immediately lose sense from an investigation, prosecution, and punishment point of view. Why? Because the investigations will not happen, and those were specific orders in those judgments. The court held, uh, held a public hearing in the case of Molina Tyson, uh, an emblematic case that we also followed in our project. And the consequence of that was that it came up with provisional measures, also in the Chichupac case, and now, some weeks ago, in the Mosote case. And, and this is a way to, to use hearing. So you see how you start putting together different tools. A hearing makes it public, exhibits the state because you have it in a very adversarial way. This is not uh, the other type of hearing. And the court said in a provisional measure that you use when irreparable harm is at stake, the court said to Guatemala, you have to suspend immediately this project to have an amnesty. And it has said the same in the case of El Mosote two weeks ago. So this is the court reacting to the backlash in a very clever way. This is the first one, uh, the first time when the court uses provisional measures while monitoring compliance with a judgment precisely to prevent that we, okay, we are not progressing that much, okay, let's not go back, yeah? And you see two key forms uh, or tools of the court at stake trying to, to do that. The other hearing that can happen is a private hearing. In those cases where there is clearly dialogue, where you see that you can sit down with the state to try to move things forward, hearings are closed, informal, around the table, uh, the big teams, the state, uh, some members of the court sit down around it, and they discuss, they talk about a potential plan of action, how to move things forward, and that dialogue has also proved effective. We have mixed feelings and mixed expressions from the people we interviewed about which of the two is more effective, the public or the private. But certainly they serve different purposes. And in some occasions you have had various private hearings in some cases. In other cases you have had just the, the public and in many cases you haven't had hearings. Having said this in relation to hearings, uh, we note a tendency to decrease hearings. In the year 2009 they were highly popular the court had about uh, 32, I think, was the year in which more hearings were held. Now we are at an average of six hearings a year, and that's a question, why? Is that because new forms, are, new forms to monitor compliance are coming in the system, or is it actually because uh, there is some <coughs> backlash? We, we, it's a question to ask uh, the system. Uh, hearings, well, okay, no, let, me, let me go to this. 
Another very important tool used by the Inter-American Court, and I think Judge Spano, you might like to see this picture, uh, is the visits, the on-site visits that the Inter-American Court is doing uh, to some emblematic places, mainly dealing with indigenous peoples, but not only. For example, in El Mozote, that is not related to indigenous people, it went also and it met with the Supreme Court in, in, uh, in El Salvador, etc. But here you see the court arriving where I arrived, that I told you is very difficult to get there. And this is at the temple that they consider absolutely sacred because uh, that's where the bodies of those who were massacred are. They are under the, the, the temple. So this is a very special place for the victims. And here is the court surrounded by the community, talking directly to the community about what has happened with the judgment. I think that is absolutely of the essence of implementation, what Rachel was mentioning this morning. We need direct connection between victims and these bodies. We need the bodies to be able to understand what is going on the, on the ground. When we spoke to those that visited Landa Sanchez at the court, uh, we got comments like this. Uh, we ordered in the judgment the creation of a special health uh, uh, like center in Landa Sanchez, but actually, we realized after visiting the place that Rabinal is not that far away. No, that's the main place. So probably what would have been best was to order a better health center in Rabinal that would have allowed health to other places and not only in Plan de Sanchez. Yes, but you only get this feeling when you have direct access to the situation. When you look at papers, this is not always transmitted. So there is a special value about being able to, to do this. Of course, this comes at expense, yes? It's not cheap, it's, and then you have also issues about independence. This visit was paid by the Guatemalan government, no? Uh, so how did that happen? Uh, well, I think it's also important to know that during the meetings, members of the state went to Plan de Sanchez. Many of them had never visited Plan de Sanchez. And when we went to Coprera institution in Guatemala that is responsible for the implementation of the judgments, they said it to us. We had never been there. Never. Yes? Whether we would be able to comply, I don't know. But certainly the court, the fact that the court came, made, put this as a priority for us. So this is a way how the court is really promoting implementation. And I also want to refer uh, to another tool that, that is interesting. I think we still need to uh, distill better the impact or potential impact of this tool, and is the one related to joining cases where the same form of preparation has been ordered and trying to follow it up as a, as a group of cases. And this has happened, for example, in relation to rehabilitation and about, I think it's nine Colombian cases, and it has happened also in relation to Guatemala, for example, 14 cases in relation to the duty to investigate, prosecute, and punish. Uh, the views of those who are party to this procedure now are not so positive. They believe that it's very difficult to get many people to, to agree on issues, that things have not really moved that much, particularly in relation to rehabilitation, more than in relation to the duty to investigate, prosecute, and punish. Uh, important to say, for example, joining uh, these orders on reparation in relation to rehabilitation happened as a result of an idea of civil society organizations in Colombia. They, they said to the court, we would like this. Why don't we do that? So again, it's to show how there is an intrinsic connection between ideas of civil society and uh, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Um, and I will just conclude, not with my book, but, uh, <laughs> but just making a few comments. On tap potential, one, the Inter-American Commission brings the cases to the court, and when the case is being litigated at the court, and even during the compliance period, the commission is meant to continue appearing before the court. I want to make a plea here for us to rethink the role of the Inter-American Commission during that stage. The Inter-American system is dealing with the increase of non-repetition. We believe that structural issues can particularly be addressed by the Inter-American Commission, which through its monitoring role, because it is monitoring the human rights situation in all 35 OAS member states, it is gathering data that is not available at the court. But we don't see direct communication between the monitoring role of the commission 
and the cases we don't. Uh, so we need to create that. That's an top potential. And I, I just can think about economic, social, and cultural rights and the potential the commission has, the power the, of information it has, just to bring that to the Inter-American Court and say, in Guatemala, in relation to HIV, this is the situation. Or if I don't have fully the situation, I know who can have that situation because the commission has such a direct contact with NGOs and with civil society that it can actually do that. Now, the Inter-American Commission made a call recently, which actually was extended until the 1st of July, so for those of you interested in this, listen to this. The Inter-American Commission made a call for uh, the creation of an academic network to support the Inter-American Commission in its work, and one of the key items there is impact and implementation. Any institution, academic, that wishes to engage with the system and that wishes to support the system can actually do that. And I think that's a great idea. That's a way to, for example, think about how to mainstream a process that would actually have an impact in relation to guarantees of non-repetition that can actually impact economic, social, and cultural rights so that we start uh, improving the situation in relation to that. So on top potential in relation to that. The other key thing is we need to recognize that in America's region, while there are countries where civil society organizations are incredibly organized, and there I show you Peru, Colombia, uh, Mexico, Argentina would be kind of my my four. Uh, and when you look at the engagement with the system, you see it through cases. So there is a direct connection. But the majority of cases, even in Latin America, don't have strong civil society organizations. And this also applies to Canada. In Canada, we were the first ones to put together around the table those persons litigating cases before the UN Treaty Monitoring Bodies. They said to us, we don't know each other, actually. Thank you for bringing us together. That was fascinating. This is Canada. Uh, but in the others, is because of the threats that exist against them, because they have not been empowered to do it. So I think the key challenge in the future is how to strengthen civil society in those countries where it is not yet as strong. And I think that, 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 is a, that will be a change if we are able to to do that in the region. And uh, national human rights institutions, you were talking about that. I cannot agree more, and we are starting to see the results in the inter-American system as well. One of the cases we documented, and, and there is a practice note in one of the publications uh, we will have, uh, is about the in vitro fertilization case and the key role that was played by uh, the Ombudsman Office in Costa Rica, precisely to ensure that Costa Rica complied with the orders, which, by the way, have to do with the right to health, in Costa Rica. So it's actually, if there, that's an untapped uh, potential. So I think I'm going to leave it there for the moment. Uh, but yes, my book. <laughs> I'm interested in the inter-American system. This is a book that really emphasizes practice and advocacy and has been written by people, uh, all of us with experience uh, engaging with the system or working within the system. Jim Caballero, for example, was the former president of the Inter-American Commission. So I think it's, it's a good uh -huh. presentation raising issues that I think are relevant well beyond the inter-American system, not only to the other regions, but also certainly to the treaty bodies. Okay, so now we will turn uh, to our two speakers on the inter-American, on the European human rights system, starting with Judge. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cleveland. It's very <laughs> difficult to, to follow in the footsteps of uh, my two colleagues from and talking about the African and the, and the South American, Latin American situation. One of the features I think we need to realize in this cross-regional context is we are dif dealing with different realities. That is clear. We are talking into systems of human rights protections which are at different levels in different social and normative contexts and that, of course, is something to bear in mind when we draw conclusions here. <clears throat> I'm going to proceed in three parts with my discussion about the European system. The first is I want to make the claim that implementation has both uh, jurisprudential dimensions and structural dimensions, and I will explain what I mean by that. I'm going to talk about the jurisprudential dimension, how the court itself not in the execution phase, 
but in its actual day-to-day -day work, is thinking about implementation. Philip, Professor Leach will talk about more of the structural dimensions, caseload, case processing of the Strasbourg Court, uh, which he knows very much about and probably more than me. I will then turn in my second part to talk about the way in this dimension has developed through the prism of what we call in the European context the interlocking process and the re-evaluation, in my view, of the principle of subsidiarity in the European context, and perhaps made the claim that in a recent Reith lecture, one famous judge of the UK, former UK Supreme Court, forgot about that phase in the life of the Strasbourg Court. He maybe should have read a bit about that before he made his famous lecture. That's, that's my first foray into that uh, issue and will be brought up and followed up in the future. The third part, I will say a little bit about the rule of law, the challenges we are facing when it comes to the tensions between the rule of law in some parts of Europe and the principle of subsidiary. So the first part, I think here it's important to realize how the history of this system has developed. The system is created, as you know, after the Second World War, uh, uh, the Council of Europe creates this convention, the European Convention on Human Rights, for the first nine or so years, there is no court. The court is created in January 1959 by a decision of the Consultative Assembly of the Council of Europe. In the first phase in the life of the court, the court is a very diplomatically oriented, small institution in the geopolitical landscape, very few cases, most of the judges non-permanent, and they are judges with uh, a professorial diplomatic background Either they were part in the founding drafting of the mechanism, but they had a very acute sense of the fact that they were not the major players in human rights jurisprudence and your, your human rights creation. In the 1970s, the court then becomes basically what the court is today, uh, an institution which is a very active player in the European human rights scene, and this happens uh, during the second phase in the life of the court, which is sometimes called the judicial phase. This is the phase in which those of you that know European human rights law, all of the big judgments were delivered by the court, judgments on the living instrument doctrine, the principle of effective and real protection of human rights, the principle of autonomous interpretation, and so forth. And most of them transpiring from cases arising out of the UK. Now, one can ask, why was this possible? Why did, the, why did the Strasbourg Court, why was it in a position to deliver all of these judgments that had this seminal impact on European human rights law and its creation? Well, the reason, I think, is rather simple, and that is because in those times, in the good old days, I think we can say, there was actually an openness and an affinity for integrated European globalized view across boundaries type uh, human rights protections. So the court, some, to some extent, also mirroring the development within the European then communities, was an international court viewing itself being able to have an impact on uh, uh, issues or elements at national level without fearing a very strong political pushback. Now that does not mean that the Strasbourg court in its History at that time did not experience that kind of pushback, but it was never pushback in the existential sense. It was never, I mean, we have to leave. You know, if, if, the Stras if, if, if the Strasbourg court uh, goes too far, we will simply leave the system. This is uh, a, an occurrence which is happening in later times, as I will come to. The third phase in the life of the court is the post-1989 fall of the Berlin Wall phase and the expansion to the east of the member states of the Council of Europe, which completely transformed the dynamic of the, of the Strasbourg system, of course, where we ended up with 47 member states, which I think is a very good thing, but many of them having a lot of structural and systemic problems and also between them having geopolitical even conflicts. Now that has created, that created an immense caseload problem in the court going into the new millennia, uh, creating a need for a reform process being set up. And this is what happened in 2010, 11, and 12, 
with the start of this so-called interlocking process, uh, I think the final phase in the part that I want to talk about was in Brighton in 2012, when the member states decided to issue a declaration, which really put the focus on this concept of subsidiarity, this idea that human rights protections should be as much as possible uh, performed at national level. But I do think, and Murray Hunt referred to this this morning, I do think to some extent the idea there was to try as much as possible to limit or to reduce the power of the Strasbourg Court on national politics, but not necessarily in, in, in its full extent to try to maintain the level of human rights protections at national level, which is the fundamental ideal with the principle of subsidiarity. That is, in other words, it is the high contracting parties, it is the member states who have this obligation. The obligation is not in Strasbourg. Now, this idea has to some extent now taken hold more and more in the Strasbourg jurisprudence by the court trying, and this is implementation in its judicial dimension, the court trying more and more through its jurisprudence to move away from purely viewing a case as a case to be resolved on the facts, but the case as being a vehicle for prescriptive guidance in other cases that can be implemented at national level. Because even though we are a permanent court, even though we are a court with approximately 300 lawyers, uh, 47 judges, we have 55, 56,000 cases. Each case decided by a chamber of seven judges or a chamber of 17 judges is, takes resources and we want to we want to use every case and, and use its impact as much as possible. So this move away from a pure dispute resolution centered view of each case into a more prescriptive view saying let's use the case to present the criteria and the guidance for the national authorities in future cases has been a very important part. Now let me then now in my second part try to deconstruct this notion of subsidiarity a bit more. One of the biggest problems in the European landscape has been that although we have uh, in many situations very strong democracies, but we also have very, a very strong border-centered view of law. Law is a creation within the member state and its legitimacy arises from the ground up. The European Convention on Human Rights has, and it may even be a labeling problem, is a foreign thing. It's a foreign object. It is something that the national authorities and the national judges in many states have never really taken to be their own, much less people on the ground, much less the regular person. It has simply been formulated as a top-down imposed normative order of law, which therefore has been easily attacked by lacking in political and domestic legitimacy. Now, I think in the implementation phase of, of, of and our inf implementation reform procedures, and I take up uh, uh, the views just expressed this morning by Professor Engstrom, which I completely disagree with, agree with, <laughs> <laughs> and, and very much agree with, sorry, <laughs> is that we have to, and I think the international human rights movement has to actively engage with the idea that the international human rights movement cannot be a closed circle of friends. Now, that is, that is a very important point. And I, when I say the international human rights movement, I'm putting myself in that part. And I'm using movement in a more open and abstract sense. All the active players in the international human rights field need to be mindful that we can talk to each other endlessly in rooms like this about how human rights are being labeled and criticized and attacked. The problem is 
we will not find the solution merely by looking at top-down procedures for implementation. Implementation has to be, can only be effectivized by winning the hearts and minds of people on the ground, the grassroots organizations, and at the end of the day, to make human rights a topic and, and a rhetoric which emanates in the minds of people everywhere. That is the problem now. To some extent, there has the international human rights movement has to some, some extent lost the war in this rhetoric. And I think my court has been to some extent uh, a part of this equation by attempting to some extent to be more ambitious than it should have been. Now, I know there are many, and I've had discussions with many of my colleagues over the past few years that say, but, but this, is a, this is a two edged sword. We should be very careful in, in not uh, uh, limiting or reducing the, the, the achievements we, we have made. Of course not. But we have to think about the sustainability of the system for the future. And I think to the extent that the judicial dimension in the work of my court and the Strasbourg court has now been evolving, it is the realization that we need, to some extent, to create a more healthy debate about the issue of human rights. When it comes to the issue of subsidiarity at a more practical level, another element which has become apparent is that it's all well and good for an international court to try to incentivize national authorities giving them guidance as to how they should decide the cases so as not to have to be in a position that all cases come to Strasbourg. But there are two elements to that concept which are crucial. One is states acting in good faith. And the second, states at national level having institutions that are structurally capable of dealing with human rights litigation and resolution. Now when I say structurally capable, I simply mean that we have a robust NGO and civil space in the state in question. But from my perspective, the most important is the interlocutor between the Strasbourg court and the national judge. I always say to national judges when I meet them, you are the first Strasbourg judges. You are the judges that the Strasbourg system relies on to make the system viable. So between us, there needs to be a symmetry. There needs to be a realization that we are not competing with each other. We are doing the same jobs. We have different roles, but at the end of the day, the system cannot survive unless you're impartial, unless you're independent, and unless you're willing to take the European Convention and human, European Human Rights Law and make it your own. And that's the third part and my final part that is the biggest challenge for the future that the European system is facing. <coughs> we are not facing the same type of problems which we heard from uh, 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 on the issues in the African system and the inter-American system. It is not a question of uh, us being faced with the kinds of, I would say, fundamental existential issues that we are dealing with at that level. Here, this, the problem is the corpus of law is all there. We have been doing this for 60 years. Uh, you, mean, you should read Philip Leach's book on, on the court and the convention. The case law is frankly massive. Now, if you want an answer to most contemporary human rights problems, at least the framework of principles to be able to decide that issue, it is in most instances in the case law of the Strasbourg Court already and in the developments at national level of that case law. I often say in nine out of 10 cases that I deal with in my job, the answer is pretty much clear from earlier case law. Then we have the 20 or so, 25 grand chamber cases a year where we tread new ground. But for a court that is dealing with thousands of cases, most of them are easily disposed of. And that should be the same for the national judge. So there are four last points that I would make under this final rubric. How have we reacted to it? So I mentioned the first one. Less focus on dispute resolution in the particular case. Of course we are deciding that case. We are finding a violation. 
or not. But we are not viewing the case through a very narrow lens. We are trying to identify in every case we deal with whether we can use that case as a vehicle for more prescriptive guidance. Second point, it is true, and I think the European Implementation Project has demonstrated this to some extent, that the, the court is in recent years being, I think, more mindful of real world consequences for its judgment. So issues of remedial measures in our judgment has become an issue which is more debated within the court. That is a step that we simply are thinking about how can we try with a remedial measure, individual or general measure, to try to get things moving via the Committee of Ministers. And this is a tricky issue because differently from the inter-American system, we do not, are not competent to, to deal with issues of execution. Thirdly, the issues as regards the rule of law. The rule of law has again uh, become, I would say, the primordial issue in international human rights law. Now this rule which all of the lawyers in this room and the social scientists and the political scientists know may have different conceptions of is in the current landscape of Europe and if you look at the grand chamber judgments of my court over the last five to ten years one can I think identify in many of them maybe most of them some manifestations of rule of law issues they're dealing with. The two biggest manifestations are appointment and dismissal of judges at national level, the independence of judges in a, in a broad sense, and the use of a provision which is Article 18 of the Convention, which has really developed in the last few years. Article 18 is a provision that allows the court to look to whether a state in restricting human rights has proceeded with what we call ulterior motives or basically political motives in tra tramping down on politi political dissidents and so forth. And this part of the case law has become now more and more to the fore because the sustainability of the system moving forward is very much uh, a sustainability that takes account of structural features, the, that we have actually interlocutors at national level who can perpetuate the ideal of subsidiarity. Because if that's not the case, at the end of the day, all the work will come back to the Strasbourg system, the system will be overflooded, and an overflooded system is not sustainable moving forward. That, that I think is clear from the way in which and from experience. So to sum up, if you look at these three parts that I mentioned, the historical trajectory, you look at the interlaken process and the way the court has been trying to deal with uh, the, the, the backlash, but also to try to incentivize national authorities to do their job. And thus, if they do their jobs, the court will re is, is legitimized and rem remaining more passive, subject to certain conditions. But now the tensions that that development is facing because of the rule of law issues that is, I would say, the jurisprudential dimension of implementation in the European system. Thank you. And for the second half of the European system, we have um, Philip Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I also have some slides, but while well, I'm getting them up here, in the meantime, there's a picture of my book, which is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you, Sarah, and I'm going to um, carry on from Judge Spano's, uh, just thinking a little bit more about the challenges and, and opportunities uh, in, in Europe. And I'm going to be speaking uh, as a pracademic, uh, so as uh, one of the members of the, of the Human Rights Law Implementation Project, you've heard a lot about uh, already today, but also as a, as a practitioner uh, representing ERAC, the European Human Rights Advocacy Centre, the Human Rights Centre that we have at, at Middlesex. 
And we litigate Strasbourg cases from, from that region of the, uh, of the former Soviet region. So um, and we have a lot of work working with local NGOs and local lawyers, bringing cases uh, against countries like Russia and Ukraine and Azerbaijan, uh, of which there is much to do, as you can imagine. So what I'm going to say is uh, informed by both, both perspectives. And I'd like to um, really make, talk, we'll talk about three areas today. Firstly, to talk about the member state challenges, and this is really where Pair started uh, uh, about the, the, uh, the denigration that we're seeing from, from certain areas, which I think we do have to look at. So that's my first area. Then I want to look at the, uh, the court, the European court and the issues around caseload and case processing, talk about some, something more substantive, and then finally just to say a few words about uh, implementation uh, of the judgments. This takes you back to uh, 2012 and the time when the UK was chairing the Committee of Ministers of the, of the Council of Europe. This was the head, do you remember this? This was the, um, for those of you who read the Times, this was the front page of the Times on the day of the Brighton Conference, the big conference that the UK organised when they were chairing. And at the front there is the British judge, president of the court at the time, Sir Nicholas Bratzer. Uh, and we need to, I think, acknowledge, as many people have done already today, that we're living through a period in which Many member states in these systems are showing uh, certainly un considerable ambivalence towards human rights systems, uh, but also in some cases we're seeing direct attacks on the legitimacy, on the effectiveness, on the over, supposedly over-interventionist nature of, uh, of these bodies. And we're seeing that from uh, some states who traditionally have traditionally been very strong supporters, including uh, in this country. But you'll all be aware of the, of the debacle over many years in the UK about prison voting rights and the then Prime Minister uh, David Cameron uh, saying very clearly that he wouldn't implement the judgment. Uh, what a, uh, what a, an example that was about the denial of the, of the rule of law. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's continuing and um, uh, since, well, si we had problems in the UK but certainly in countries like the Netherlands and Belgium often around uh, um, an immigration, domestic immigration, cost of domestic immigration context, there has also been a lot of pushback. Let's fast forward to, <coughs> to Denmark last year. Denmark, uh, they came up with, the, during their period of the ch chairing of the, of the continuances, with an initial, with a, with a Copenhagen declaration uh, that I think was uh, really a, represented a direct attack on the independence of the court. Um, that led to, uh, I'm very pleased to say, a strong pushback from civil society, but also from some states. Um, Alice and I wrote some, we call it a wolf in sheep's clothing, and called for it to be, to, be, to, be re, to be rewritten. But there was a strong pushback. Again, remember, this is Denmark a year ago. Just quickly to look at some of the, uh, some of the suggestions. And, and Murray talked, uh, set us off this morning talking about the hijacking of subsidiarity. Um, but this was in the, in the again, in the asylum and immigration context, um, I think an example of that, because the declaration as originally drafted uh, had various pretexts for states to apply political pressure at the, at the court. Uh, and at the root of that was this misconstruction uh, of what subsidiarity and what margin of appreciation uh, really means. Uh, supposedly allowing the court or even requiring the court to, to limit or delegate aspects of its, uh, of its jurisdiction uh, to states. Uh, one particular concern was this, was this uh, part of the declaration, um, saying that when examining cases related to asylum and immigration, uh, to take full account of the effectiveness of domestic procedures and where those procedures are assessed as operating fairly and with respect for human rights to avoid intervening, uh, so telling the European Court to avoid intervening except in the most uh, exceptional circumstances. Another example, uh, I think, was a, a, a real challenge to the principle of universality of human rights. Um, the assertion, as you can see here, that rights should be determined at the national level um, as a natural step in the evolution of the Convention system, protected predominantly at national level, in accordance with the constitutional traditions and in light of national circumstances. Now, fortunately, there was uh, strong, uh, as I said, strong pressure, strong uh, resistance, and the draft was uh, really fundamentally rewritten. 
Um, but this was Denmark, this was a year ago. So this is the, the reality. And of course, there have been a series of other uh, developments that I think represent the hostile climate in Europe, um, both sort of domestically. So look at Russia in 2015, introducing a law that allows the Constitutional Court in Russia to declare a decision unimplementable because it breaches the Constitution. And they've used that twice uh, already in relation to prisoner voting rights. Ah, where have we heard that before? <laughs> uh, and also in relation to, to UCOS. We also have financial problems, as many people have said, uh, with Russia uh, following the, the invasion of Crimea and the, um, the um, Russian Parliamentary Assembly's, Assembly members losing the right to vote uh, in the Parliamentary Assembly and then withdrawing. Uh, Russia also then withdrew its payment, uh, its contribution of 33 billion euros to the Council of Europe budget. Uh, and also Turkey has reduced, significantly reduced its, uh, its contributions. And those, um, those are already having uh, clear uh, implications for the whole of the Council of Europe. I'm talking mainly about the court today, uh, but one can, one, we must not forget the, the, all the other elements of the Council of Europe human rights system, but the impact on bodies like the European Committee of Social Rights that Aoife may want to talk about later. Uh, and, and these cuts are having a direct, uh, as they are intended to do, I think, having a direct effect uh, on the ability of those bodies to, to, to do their work. So um, we have to be, as so many people have said, alive to this, we have to engage and we have to rebut these misconceptions and, and fend off attacks where we possibly where we possibly can. I want to then move on to my second area and talk about the court's uh, caseload and make some points about case processing in terms of, again, if our rubric is opportunities and challenges for the system. Um, 58,000 uh, current uh, pending cases at the court. Um, if, if we were here well, back in 2011, we'd be looking at 160,000 pending cases. So the figures have come right down, but of course that's still a significant number, and they've been inflated in recent years by a large number of cases coming, for example, from, from Turkey, because of what's going on there, and from eastern Ukraine and Crimea because of the Russian occupation and, and human rights violations in, in those regions. So, um, I'm not going to propose for a minute to suggest a solution to this the, the caseload problem that we've all been debating for decades, but I do have, um, I think, four um, points to, to add to the debate about the court's functioning. And the first is uh, in relation to uh, prioritisation. Prioritisation of cases. Uh, and uh, in, in my view, I think it would be extremely helpful if the court were to exercise its discretion more often to apply its priority policy that it does have more flexibly, more creatively, dare I say, so that the case is raising the most important issues, the case raising uh, the most important issues affecting the largest numbers of people can be genuinely fast-tracked. And what we know from, uh, if you remember the Diane Pretty case from the UK, that was dealt with within four months. Uh, so it is possible, I'm not saying for a minute that that's going to be possible for, for many cases, but why not fast track a few emblematic significant <coughs> I don't suggest it's going to be easy to decide which case cases that should be, but here's an example, here's a suggestion. This is the Russian, one of our cases, so I'm, 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 I have an interest in it of course, but, but just to give you an example, this is about the insidious uh, Russian in foreign agent, so-called foreign agents law, which has, has crippled the ability of, of Russian NGOs to do their work. Uh, it's led in a number of cases to their dissolution. Uh, a lot of NGOs have gone down, sometimes voluntarily, to avoid the, the fines that would be imposed under this legislation. Now, there's been a Strasbourg case um, pending going back to 2013, right when, when the war was uh, in the early days, uh, for a whole group of, in, of Russian NGOs. It was a sort of group case. Um, here we are, six years later, still undecided. Now, given the you know, global repression of civil society uh, that a number of people have already mentioned today, um, the European Court's judgment will be a global precedent uh, and, and extremely, whatever they say, will be extremely important. Uh, and there's an example I say, could it have been done earlier? Could it have been pushed through in, in a couple of years and, and, um, uh, and not allowed to, to, to wait so long? So prioritisation would be my first step. 
Secondly, um, settlements and unilateral declarations. The, 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 um, the process of, of friendly settlements is becoming, I think, more and more important in, certainly in the European system, and also the ally, this sort of linked issue of unilateral declarations, where cases get struck out, even without agreement, but where the court essentially takes a view that what the government is offering is, is, is sufficient to resolve the case. So those are unilateral declarations. Um, and I would say there are certainly advantages to, to, to this process. It's an established part of the system. It's not going to go away. There are advantages for it, potentially for everyone, for, for, for applicants, for states, for the system in reducing the, the caseload. But um, I do would say that we have to be, I think, very, very careful to make sure that cases are not being dismissed through these processes without the underlying issues being uh, properly resolved. And again, I'm going to declare an interest, but just to give you some examples, um, a colleague from the Georgian Young Lawyers Association and I wrote about a, a situation in Georgia that illustrates this. Uh, and these are about cases uh, in relation to police and prison abuse in Georgia. What's happening in Georgia is that, that a lot of these cases coming coming through, and the Georgian government is settling them, trying to settle and saying, we, 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 we breached the convention here. It's a breach of Article 2, Article 3, whatever it was, and we are going to uh, actually undertake to carry out an effective investigation. Well, that's terrific as far as it goes. That's then being written into settlements or unilateral declarations, uh, and the cases are being knocked off the Strasbourg case of fine. But what happens after that? You know, Whose role is it, is it to check that there is actually a, an effective investigation? Is it the court? Is it the committee ministers? And depending on which route you go, it could be actually the either. And here's an example where you know, if, you, if you apply to get the cases reopened that have been struck out, this is, a, is an area where the court is getting into implementation questions, arguably. But I think we have, don't have clarity about that, and I think more could be done on that. Uh, can, we, you know, can we say that we have a proper means of really assessing whether an undertaking like that is being uh, carried out or not. Then my third area in relation to the court's uh, work is, is conflict cases. This is South Ossetia, 2008 conflict between Georgia and Russia. And again, we have an interest. We, we're doing a series of cases uh, from our families affected by that conflict. In the, in the draft uh, Copenhagen de Declaration that I mentioned, there was a proposal there to establish separate mechanisms to deal with uh, both interstate and individual cases arising from international conflicts. It was said in the interest of achieving, quote, a balanced caseload, unquote. No, uh, no uh, proposal at all was put forward as to what the separate mechanism would be. Um, what it would mean at the moment uh, is that the court, if this were to go ahead, the court would have uh, no remit over human rights litigation arising from conflict in regions such as eastern Ukraine, Crimea, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Nagorno Karabakh, northern Cyprus, and so on. And beyond the Copenhagen Declaration, I've also heard it said within the court that the court is not really equipped to deal with uh, cases like this. Now, I would be the first to acknowledge that there are real difficulties created by conflict cases. Uh, practical, legal, factual, evidential difficulties. No question about that. But how many other areas of law is that also not true? Is that a reason for excluding those cases? And what about the domestic violence cases that we're doing more and more of? They're also very, very difficult for other reasons. Are we really suggesting that we should uh, rule out the court's uh, limit in, in, uh, in, in those cases uh, to effectively deny justice for very vulnerable victims uh, across Europe that are really let down at the national level. So I have real concerns about what I'm, what I'm hearing about uh, conflict cases. And finally, um, I want to come back to uh, the question of the court's approach to systemic issues and redress that, um, that certainly Judge Spanner touched on and, and others have. And as uh, many of you will know, the court in the last 15 years has developed its significantly developed its approach in certain cases, certainly moving from a declaratory approach to, to, to making recommendations to being quite prescriptive in the operative provisions of the judgment. These, these are the pilot judgments, the Article 46 judgments. This is the voiding the you know, avoiding the narrow lens that Spano just referred to. Uh, and I think it's been um, it's been hugely uh, significant. Um, 
in certainly in, in, in particular areas. And at the Human Rights Law Implementation Project, we looked at this and, and, and talked to people about this. And certainly there are there are two clear benefits that, that uh, we would identify, as written up by Alison and uh, Anne in the Human Rights Law Review earlier this year. So firstly, that um, the, it's, it's very helpful uh, to have clarity about precise obligations which arise from judgments. So providing clear guidance to states is, uh, is, uh, as to what is required to be done is, can be very helpful. And it can strengthen the hand of particular domestic actors who are having, perhaps having to struggle within the domestic polity against others who are uh, perhaps uh, more reluctant. But even in, uh, in where there are problems, um, the evidence suggests that um, it can be this, this more prescriptive approach or more, more specific approach to redress can be helpful by applying pressure on states that are unwilling to, uh, uh, to comply with their obligations by reducing their scope to, to evade, uh, evade their obligations, if, if you like. Um, it may even help the process of dialogue at committee ministers' meetings by, uh, uh, and by prescribing general measures in, in relation to structural problems that can be seen as help, helpful identi to, to identify um, solutions to shared problems, things that we see in a lot of different countries, uh, and it can, can certainly help, help with that process. We also though, we acknowledge through this research that there may be risks to greater prescriptiveness. Um, judges and officials that we spoke to were uh, very obviously very aware of the danger of getting it wrong. And if you make a prescriptive, or as regards individual measures or general measures, if you're prescriptive, you get it wrong. If you don't know the context properly, um, then that can be can be risky. It could be possibly counterproductive if the uh, the flexibility of the commission ministers and final execution judgments is limited during that post judgment phase. We've all been talking about the, the dialogue process. Well, it possibly, if you limit that too much, can there, can there be risks? Well, that was certainly acknowledged by our interviewees. But we saw no evidence of a pattern of pushback by states against, state actors against, uh, against the state of So, um, let me finish uh, just by saying a few words about um, implementation and um, we could have a game, I'd ask you to guess which cases these relate to. But these are, um, these are four cases, again, four error cases, just examples. Um, and to start with the optimistic one, this is Judge Volkov, <coughs> um, who was dismissed as a Supreme Court judge in Ukraine. And the Strasbourg Court, having found that his dismissal was unfair, ordered his reinstatement, uh, which did happen. And that's him back before the Supreme Court after he was, he was uh, reinstated. But also that it led to changes in the law. It led to changes in the constitution in Ukraine because the constitution sets out uh, who sits on the High Council of Justice that appoints and dismisses judges, which was packed with politicians. So there you can see um, uh, a good implementation story. But the other three cases are, are not. Uh, and um, so there's. The top right is the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, uh, and uh, two cases brought by the Grand or decided by the Grand Chamber in 2015 about people who lost from both sides, as it were, who lost home, land, property in the conflict and never been able to get back. In 2015, the, the uh, Grand Chamber in both cases told both governments, Ar Armenia and Azerbaijan, to set up some kind of property restitution mechanism for the more than a million uh, people who are more affected by that. Has anything happened since 2015? Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Russell Jafarov, bottom right, is an article eight, example of the Article 18 cases that Judge Stanley just mentioned. A human rights activist in Azerbaijan, imprisoned in the crackdown in 2014. He wins in 2016, gets an Article 18 decision. The court specifically decides that, that the criminal prosecution against him was, was deliberately targeted to punish him for his human rights work. That's the wording that they punish him and just prevent him from doing it. And there's been another similar decision la uh, at the end of last year from another Azerbaijan human rights activist. What's happened since then? Well, he was released, but his criminal conviction still stands and there's no movement to, uh, to, 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 to the moment of that changing. Finally, Chechnya. I have to mention Chechnya at the bottom left. This is 
one of the, uh, the, the relatives of the people who were killed in, in the, in the, in the Essen Hambertov case, which was a, an aerial bombardment of a village by Russian military village, tiny little village on the edge of Chechnya and Dagestan, killed villagers, killed her members of her family, destroyed some of the houses, forced the villagers to literally flee, run across the border to Dagestan to escape. Um, this is representative of the 300 uh, Strasbourg judgments that, are, that have been handed down now finding the Russian security forces in breach of, of serious violations of the convention in, in the North Caucasus. Where are we on implementation? Well, they pay, the Russian government pays damages, but beyond that, uh, we've got very little. So very significant challenges about implementation. No, no political will whatsoever to investigate her case or, or similar cases. Big, big implementation challenges. Uh, and I don't say they're necessarily easy cases, but I do say that they therefore creates an obligation on all of us to, to work out how we can do to do better. Do we have any, to finish, do we have any insights from our research project? Um, and this is being, it well, has been written up for this a special issue of the Journal of Human Rights Practice that will come out later this year, do you think? Yeah, later this year. Um, and uh, just, just to finish, uh, I think a couple of lessons in relation, or a couple of ideas in relation to implementation. Uh, and, and this mirrors, I think, what a number of people have said today. I mean, if we're saying that dialogue is at the heart of the uh, implementation process, can we see ways of expanding this dialogue, increasing it in some way, increasing its transparency, transparency um, developing in some way? What can be done to revitalise the uh, Committee of Ministers meetings that Clara mentioned earlier, which are, of course, closed meetings that involve only states, not the court, and certainly not victims. What can be done when we hear from the, and we are, in response to you, Clara, we are not yet the inter-American court in Northern Europe. Um, you heard from Clara about the, the separate um, hearings that the court has on implementation. So it wasn't talking about merits hearings, those are separate implementation hearings. Uh, where they, and they go in country, as you saw from the, from the picture. That reminded me of the, of, of the court's practice that's really defunct now, of holding fact-finding hearings. So not on implementation, but on the merits of cases. And I was involved myself in some of the Turkish cases a few years ago. And again, you get the same feeling that you got from the picture of the engagement, the importance of the engagement of the court, the court, the court as an institution, the judges at that level. I mean, certainly in the Kurdish cases, you, you it was extraordinarily powerful to see families coming, giving evidence to judges, to international judges, when they've never been able to give uh, that evidence to any judge uh, in, in, that, in Turkey at the time. So there was, those were fact on the but the same point. Um, and what we see, you know, as Clara will tell you, they, there have been instances in which ministers have been called in the American context and have had to explain themselves at these hearings. Certainly, uh, and certainly underline the importance of getting of, of, of being in situ so that the local, so that the local NGOs can be involved with families and uh, it makes it much more accessible. What can we do uh, in the European context to you know, to develop? They, the systems are different, of course, as Judge Spano said, and the court there are, there are. But what can we do to uh, develop the, the situation as, as we've got at, at the moment? Um, and in the, as I understand it from, you know, from working with Clara. What, what particularly has worked in the context of those hearings is where the court is facilitating the communication between the court and the victims. It's not necessarily imposing, but it's facilitating the sorry, yeah, sorry, the state and the victims, sorry. Um, and they, you know, in some of the hearings, they've then come, come away with an action plan that they've negotiated and drafted at the hearing. Uh, so, so what more can we do to, um, if you like, develop the grassroots sort of level of implementation, again, that George Spano was was referring to, to um, uh, earlier. And I'll just finish to also say something very briefly about the, the, the means of assessing implementation, which again I think we could, we could look at. And this is discussed particularly in art, another art, yet another article by Alice and Anne that's coming out. Um, the, the need for, in terms of assessing implementation, the, the need for an evidence-based public record of the status quo of implementation uh, in this process, and an authoritative means of determining whether the measures taken by the state do in fact satisfy what, we, what the decision said. And if you don't have uh, that kind of record, if you don't have such a determination, then supranational bodies like the committee ministers, like the, the court in the, in the 
Commission and Court in the African and the Inter-American context can't do this job. And I don't think do the job properly. I don't think at the moment we have a clear uh, a system of, of knowing how on what basis in the European process uh, the Committee of Ministers is making that assessment. You know, it's closing judgments, it's closing down judgments, as, as Anne was saying this morning. But how do we how do we know on what basis? And are there, are, is there an evidence-based record of um, of compliance that we can, we can look at? I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Indeed. I'd just like to flag uh, two points. One is I'd like to um, underscore Judge Spano's point about the relationship between the rule of law and human rights. Uh, compliance because I think it's clear that in states where there are not functioning rule of law institutions, states will not uh, comply with their human rights obligations in the first instance and they will also not effectively implement judgments from bodies such as uh, the regional human rights courts. So um, these bodies also have to pay attention to the underlying structural rule of law issues um, in making these judgments. The second point I think that is interesting is we've seen the trend um, towards more detailed remedies um, across different types of human rights mechanisms. It's also a trend in UN treaty bodies um, which have gone from being extremely general to in some cases being quite specific. Um, also because states and civil society actors generally appreciate greater specificity but this raises common problems with respect to um, implementing and also assessing implementation. Okay, we are in fact officially out of time, uh, but I would like, uh, audience permitting, to take a couple of questions um, and then we'll free you for your coffee break. So, yes. Uh, yeah, I have a question, um, possibly mostly for Judge Barlow, but it might be of interest to others as well. Um, the implication of what you were saying about the court's need to persuade um, and to, to be persuasive, to speak to national audiences, to build this idea of national interlocutors who will be the kind of guardians of a proper notion of subsidiarity and so on. So, which implies almost that the court needs a kind of PR strategy to do that. That doesn't trivialise the idea too much. So I'm interested, obviously one of the problems we've had here is that the Strasbourg court is used as a kind of punch bag by the right wing media and so on. And we've always said, oh, but the court can't answer back. The court can't defend itself. I think the implication of what you were saying is that actually the court can, if it does so carefully, perhaps do that. So I'm just interested in any ideas about how courts or commissions in the other regions can develop that kind of almost communication strategy, if that makes sense. How can they translate what they do sort of in, in every sense of the word to, to kind of make sense and gain purchase at the domestic level? Yeah, just, yeah. Yes. Um, my name is Kenny Witcher from the Kenya Human Rights Commission. Uh, my question is to Commissioner Wito. Um, you spoke about the positives on implementation of like African human rights treaty law in the continent, especially when it comes to the network of African non national human rights institutions. But my question was, could you talk a bit about um, um, the culture of impunity, especially when it comes to enforcement of judicial, I mean, of decisions by both the Commission and the Court, and recent attacks on the African um, Commission on Human and People's Rights in the wake of its decision to grant the Coalition of African Lesbians Observer Status. We're seeing active, um, like, efforts to kind of, like, fix the ACHPR. And the fear now is that once they are done with the African Commission, it will the next space will be the African court. Thank you. Maybe one more from the audience? Do I once? Do I twice? No? Okay. So, just. I think that's a, a very, very important question from Professor Donald. Uh, I would maybe answer with, with, I think there are three ways in which one can view this uh, issue. One is the court has been heavily engaged in the dissemination of knowledge of the court's work. Now, there are various ways in which this is done. Um, one is, of course, uh, we put a lot of resources in our IT. Uh, those that are interested in the work of the court, there is a lot of accumulation of knowledge on our website. Very recently, we launched what we call a knowledge sharing network, which is, for the moment, an internal 
processing uh, uh, IT development, but we are now and have also established what we call the Superior Court Network, which now has, and I, I, there are some caveats to this, about 70 courts in the 47 member states, not, in, not, not from every member state, but from many other member states, which creates, uh, which, which have a focal point in their court, which can interact with the court by uh, IT means. And we recently, just last week, had a big conference of the focal point assistance from all of these courts that came to the Strasbourg court to, to engage with the way in which we could disseminate knowledge of the work of the court. Now, this is more, more at the technocratic, technocratic level. I asked the question this morning to uh, uh, Jimena about the issue of formalized procedures. There, I think that is something I am very interested in. I, we have to, I think, and I always say this to my colleagues, there is a difference between an international court of human rights and a classic national court. It's just a different dynamic and paradigm that we're dealing with. Of course, we have to be careful in any outreach program, the court's impartiality, the court's independence, the court's shying away from being considered at all to be a political organ is something we have to be aware of. But that, in, in an international setting, we have to be creative in the way we engage with those stakeholders, and I use the word stakeholders in a very broad sense, uh, that are, are a part of the actual effectivization, effectiveness of the work of the world. So I think we need to find ways, and I think we are reflecting on ways to, to have more formal procedures when it comes to interacting with the civil society uh, space, of course, with governments, bar associations, and so forth. I would also here mention, and that's also something I alluded to in my question this morning, there has been a big evolution when it comes to third-party interventions in the court. And there I think we need to increase that very much, especially in selected cases, where we're dealing with perhaps novel human rights issues and even issues where we can expect and foresee implementation problems. That the NGOs really look to using their resources in a targeted manner to come to us with a curia or third party interventions to give us the knowledge that we can integrate into our thinking in a case, of course, based on an adversarial procedure. Right. I didn't get to the name. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, let me start first with the issue of uh, the attack on the Africa Commission. And let me indicate that in the context of Africa, uh, we're dealing with a very homophobic country. And even though I'd say the Africa Commission's decision was far reaching, the AU Assembly of Heads of State and Government thought that it was going to create problems for them in the national level. That is, for those who do, who, who do not know what happened in the Africa Commission's issues, the observer status it gave to an NGO on LGBTI issues to have observer status before an AU organ. And ultimately, the, Afri uh, the Africa Commission is an organ of the AU. And its decisions and everything it does ends up at the AU Executive Council. And so the problem was, if at the highest continental level, we have understood the charter to, to have cultural implications and in, our, in this context we think heads of state and government have not reached the stage where we expect one organ to go that far we will push back so what we did as a network was first to communicate our displeasure against the reprisal you know, in, this, in this case, against the Africa Commission. And to also insist that the Africa Commission 
you know, stands where it is. And we working together as a network with the Commission, engaging with the Africa and the, the, the EU Commission. We let them appreciate that you cannot have a human rights strategy that disenfranchises people at a certain level. That doesn't allow certain people to have the same rights. And then we still talk about being, you know, uh, heads of state who have a human rights strategy. So where we stand now is we're trying to see what we can do to make sure that the Afghan community carries our message across. I mean, Africa Commission, Union Commission carries our message across to the AU heads of state and governments at yes, when the next meet. Now we have the opportunity to have a forum in September, a policy forum with the AU Commission, that is National Human Rights Commission and the AU Commission. And we and executives of the AU Commission will be there and some heads of states with seven representatives, their permanent representatives, would be there. And so we intend to raise this issue because it undercuts the independence of the Commission and sends wrong signals. And we don't know what next, whether that will not go to the court. So working together, we expect to ensure that that decision is not implemented. Thank right, thank you. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, yeah, very briefly. Uh, I should have said that the Inter-American Court in particular uh, is becoming a, an older institution and as such its jurisprudence is also beginning to change. So we have new things like the jurisprudence on economic, social and cultural rights, but when it comes down to reparation, I don't think we are getting from the court the same decisions we used to get in the past. And now there are various decisions, and I can start showing one by one, where the court is trying precisely as a response to implementation challenges <coughs> to order less forms of preparation and easier forms of preparation to implement. And, and this is a challenge. And at the same time, I think the level uh, of evidence that is required to prove harm in relation to reparations, etc., is going up. And I think this is creating issues also of legal certainty because people were accustomed to a different type of system and things are changing. And in relation to your question, just to complement the answer of Jimena this morning, whether there is a formalized system, I wouldn't call it a real formalized system, but there are many mechanisms through which civil society can engage with the court. One of recent addition is the Inter-American Forum that has been happening already for three years, uh, where you know, it's a big, massive event for the commission, the court, civil society, etc., uh, gathered together to talk about issues of common interest. Uh, but when the court also visits the state, as you said, Jimena, uh, the court also engages with civil society. The hearings, be them on merits or uh, implementation, are also opportunities for that. The visits it does. So there are many opportunities for the court to have better access to, to civil society and vice versa. Great. Okay. So now we can have coffee. We will reconvene, I guess, slightly after one of um, And please join me in thank you.